fourth time I've done it. The first time I've done it without Tim here. Um, Tim would come in and he'd talk with me for a few minutes, about an hour beforehand, get me kind of relaxed because I did a lot of tight. And, and I, I really missed that. So I just really wanted to say that. My talk here, I'll try not to get too serious, but I want to talk about dangerous and unpredictable tornado paths. And I could have added to the title, a deadly hard to see tornado, or dealing with those deadly hard to see tornadoes as well, because the, the El Reno storm was really something very dangerous and, and somewhat unique. There's the path from the National Weather Service. It started going southeast, headed east, accelerated eastward across Highway 81, where I got Mike Bettis, and then took a hard left turn. And that left turn, I think, is what, what killed our friends. Let's look at some other 2013 tornado tracks. Here's one in Mississippi back in April of this year. And you can see the tornado track is relatively straight. There's some minor deviations, but it went for 68 miles or so. I call that a relatively straight tornado track. Pretty large tornado. One person got killed in Mississippi. If we look at the uh, SPC mesoanalysis here. 500 millibar winds, if you look right here, that's our tornadic cell. We look at the winds over Mississippi there. The winds are about 60 knots or so. Pretty strong 500 millibar flow up about 18,000 feet above uh, sea level. Here's another tornado, the Moore, Oklahoma tornado, which you guys all know about, EF5. Sadly, 24 people were killed. This one's not as straight or as long as the last track, but I'd still call it relatively straight. It does. I guess I need to keep from getting too far over here to keep our microphone good here. Anyhow, I want to point out it is going to the right just a little bit, but all in all, it's a fairly relatively straight track. The storm motion on this was nothing that was, was really surprising. But we look at the 500 millibar winds again here. If you look at your colors here, we had winds that were like 55, 60 knots at 500 millibars over central Oklahoma then. And I would throw this in as another relatively straight track. Now, can contrast those tracks with this one. Here's the Bennington tornado. There are a lot of chasers in this room on that. It just kind of sat there for a, an hour and kind of did a little loop de loop. I was expecting it to move eastward and I positioned myself east of Bennington, and then Sean and I decided that, well, we'll come back to it because it doesn't seem to be moving a whole lot, so we, we stayed in this area here. And this one stayed, thankfully, just to the west of I-135. Very different tornado, very different track. Let's look at the 500 millibar winds on this one. If you look right in here, a little hard to read the wind barbs, but it's about 30 or 35 knots of flow at 500 millibars. That's right over here. And that's uh, quite a bit less than the last two tornadoes I showed you. It's about half to two-thirds the flow. Let's look at some un other unusual tornado motion cases here. Here's a uh, really weird case I've always intended to go back and look at where the motion was way to the right of that 500 millibar flow at times 90 degrees or more to the right of what I would consider relatively strong 500 millibar flow. This is back 14... I guess, yeah, 14, no, it's 12 years ago, 2002. This is a tornadic supercell that developed northwest of Greensburg and over about a four or five hour period went eastward and produced a lot of tornadoes. And I want you to notice the motion on some of these tornadoes, the original tornadoes over here just east of Dodge City. And by the way, Tim was out trying to deploy probes on these tornadoes. This is one of his earlier attempts to deploy probes. But you see these tornadoes here, I've got an arrow. These, these actually formed and, and built back to the southwest. The tornado tracks were actually south-southwest in here at times. I was on this tornado, which is over northwest of uh, Greensburg, north of Mullenville. This one went southeast, or south-southeast. I positioned myself east of it. And I kept going south because I had in my head, well, that 500 millibar flow is about 50 knots or so. In fact, I'll come back to that. I want to show you that the 500 millibar flow is around 50 knots. This is actually an upper air map. 
It's not off the SPC mesoanalysis. The observed wind at Dodge City was 45 knots, observed wind 50 knots at Topeka. And rock sounding said that the winds were between 45 and 50 knots. That's pretty good 500 millibar flow. So I was expecting that storm and the related tornadoes to move east, northeast, or east. And instead, the tornadoes were moving southeast. And I kept dropping south, thinking, well, this tornado is going to move east and it'll go north of me here. And it's almost like the tornado kept following me. And I got into some trouble on the road. I had to really speed to get ahead and away from that tornado. And that kind of shook me up a little bit. I remember that very well. Here's a little closer graphic showing that tornado moving southeastward here. And remember, your 500 millibar winds are kind of like this. You might expect the 500 millibar winds to carry the storm and maybe it, to go just a little bit right, like most supercells do. Instead, the tornadoes in the storm went southeastward. Now, this was more of a storm complex with some individual supercells in here. There's a, there's a rotation here, another one here. Both of these are producing tornadoes. This is the one I was following. And another one developing down here to the west of Mullenville that produced another tornado. So it was a really complicated little uh, complex, a supercell complex is what I would call it. So that was an interesting case. Now, it's not uncommon for tornado tracks to drift leftward toward the end of the, the path. If you know anything about tornadoes or have done any reading about how tornadoes behave, you've probably seen this, this graphic here uh, by Don Burgess, who spoke last year at the conference. This goes way back to 1982, but he showed us how mesocyclones develop and then you get tornadoes within those mesocyclones sometimes, and if they're on the ground for a while, the mesocyclone may kind of, so to speak, drift a little further back uh, of the storm, it, it gets surrounded by cool air, cool downdraft air, which kind of pulls it back. And so the tornado toward the end of its track may have a little bit of a left hook here. And then while that's happening, you may get a new mesocyclone forming to the east or the east northeast, like right here, and you get another tornado. You can see if you get successive tornadoes, he's, he's shown here where each of these has a little bit of a left hook. I've seen that a lot. It doesn't always happen, but it's not uncommon. But sometimes you get some really extreme left deviations that don't seem to fit into that scenario. Like here's the Hoisington tornado. This is 13 years ago, I guess. Central Kansas, just north of Great Bend. And here's uh, my little map when I went out and I did my damage survey. And what's interesting here, I know Hoisington's the town that got all the publicity here because it did a lot of damage, uh, F4 damage at that time. We didn't have an EF, EF scale yet. And one person got killed, and this was after dark. And this was a pretty sobering tornado because it was really, I won't get off into that, but it was really weird walking into Boisington in the dark and seeing all the damage there. Anyhow, here's your tornado goes through Heston, uh, Poisington, pardon me. Goes up here, notice it makes a hard left turn. And it's pretty wide here, like a, a quarter to a third mile wide was the track at that point. It actually went back to the west-northwest almost two miles. These are mile section markers here. I wasn't quite sure where it ended and it missed most of the farms in that area, but it made a very hard left turn and it was fairly large at that point. But thankfully it was out in open country, pretty much. I would call that kind of like a backwards C or my wife says maybe you ought to call it a backwards comma. Maybe that's a little more accurate. But it did this two mile thing right at the end of the track. Let's look at the well, I, I was going to point out that the 500 millibar winds here were about 50 knots out of the southwest as well. Let's look at the Greensburg tornado here. Here's the Greensburg supercell and all the tornadoes that occurred with that back in 2007 that we're all pretty familiar with. Here's Rick Schmidt's picture of the tornado as it was hitting Greensburg after dark, lit by lightning. Here's a close-up of the Greensburg track. And I think most of you are somewhat familiar with this, but toward the end of the track, it did that left hook, but it made a pretty hard left here, and then it did kind of a curly cue. But it was pretty large when it started going to the left or back to the west, or back to the northwest and the west northwest. And here in Rick's pictures, you can see the tornado, and then a couple minutes later, he's shooting in the same area that by liking, and you can't see it. I think it may be buried in rain over here because it's going back to the left. Well, I just took some of these somewhat unusual paths and decided just do kind of a very simple analysis here. Let's see. Well, for some reason, 
I'm missing some of my numbers here. They've seemed to disappear. So I'll try to talk about this. One of the things, let's, let's, let's see what's here. That's kind of weird. I don't know why that PowerPoint slide is doing that. But what I wanted to point out was I looked at the 850, which is about 5,000 5, 5, feet above sea level, 700 millibar winds, about 10,000 feet above sea level, and also the 500 millibar winds, which is about 18,000 feet above sea level. And I did some averaging and kind of looked at the individual winds. I found one of the most interesting things, and it's overly simplistic, don't read too much into it. But I averaged the 700 and 500 millibar winds. Unfortunately, my slide here is doing something a little weird in the presentation. I have 700 millibar winds listed here and 500 were over here and they're off the edge. And I'm not sure what the issue there is. That's probably something to do with the way I put uh, the slide in there. But uh, I averaged the 700 and 500 millibar winds and the reason I took that level is because that's, that's roughly three to maybe six kilometers above ground. And that's roughly the middle level of the storm or the lower mid-levels of the storm. It's above low levels. And that's where your mesocyclones are often the most intense. And if the winds around the storm are interacting with the storm and pushing it along, maybe that's, that's a good area to look. I also looked at 300 millibars and found that most of the cases I looked at, the 300 millibar winds were pretty similar. They were all pretty strong. So I looked at 700 and 500 and did some averaging. And I found, and I'll just have to kind of wing this here, if we did the averages of 700 and the 500 millibar column over here, I found that with these straighter tracks, longer tracks, we had the winds that were the average more up around 50, 55 knots. Pretty strong through that level. And when we looked at the more deviating tracks, particularly this Bennington one that just looped around, the average there was almost half what those straighter tracks were. I got an average of about 30, 35 knots at 700 and 500 millibars. And so the winds weren't that strong. They were just strong enough to support a supercell in that environment. You usually need 30 to 35 knots of 500 millibar flow is what I tell uh, chasers who do forecasting. You need that to support a supercell. That's kind of the bottom range there. And the rest of the winds up through the atmosphere weren't that strong around that. And so they, this, is, this is a fairly weak wind field that would produce or support supercells. And so that may be one reason that that tornado, I think if I were to speculate, when you have a stronger mid-level winds, the winds are so strong, they're dominating the storm motion and by association the tornado motion. And as you get your winds weaker in the atmosphere, but they're still capable of supporting a supercell and you get a tornado, when they're more in the 30 to 35 knot range in the 7 to 500 millibar area, what happens is that other processes come into play and the winds aren't strong enough to dominate the storm motion. You may have strong convergence going on at the ground near a boundary, and that may be dominating keeping the storm anchored in a certain spot because the winds aloft are not strong enough to push it. There may be internal dynamics in the storm going on that we don't understand that are dictating the motion. Like sometimes the tornado is within a larger mesocyclone, and then if, if the winds aren't strong enough to push the mesocyclone around, or long, the tornado may move around within the mesocyclone and do some really weird looping, which may be what happened in the Bennington case. So I was trying to show that with this graphic here. I also looked at my Mullenville storm where the tornadoes went southeast and kind of freaked me out. And that was an interesting one in that this 500 millibar flow, which if I put it over here would be around 50 knots. But the 700 millibar flow, the 700 millibar flow, flow was relatively weak. It was like about 28 knots. And I had trouble finding other cases where there was that much difference between the 700 and the 500 millibar flow. And so that may suggest some other things. I'm just speculating that if your 700 millibar winds at 10,000 feet aren't that strong, but maybe it's strong enough aloft through the shear to support a supercell, maybe there's things that happen with the way the precipitation falls. And maybe that affects the tornado motion. Maybe there's some things going on with what we call vertical pressure gradients. I don't know. I'm not even going to try to say. I'm going to take a look at that a little bit more. I won't go off on that direction there. But I thought this is an interesting case. Our other cases we looked at had strong left deviations toward the end of the track. Not just little hooks, but fairly, fairly sharp left deviations, particularly with the Hoisington tornado. I found if you average the 7 to 500 millibar winds there, that the, the average winds were more in the 40 to 45 mile roughly in that area. Don't want to get too hung up on numbers here. 
not as strong as your straight track winds, which are more up in the 50s. So there may be something going on there that the, the winds are strong enough to push the mesocyclone along, but we're seeing some other things happen with the track at the end, where some of the storm motion dynamics are within the storm. I don't know. Let's, let's look at the El Reno tornado here. This doesn't show real well, but here's the track from satellite. It's here, and then it, it even looks like it's a little sharper left deviation than some of the track maps I've seen. That had a really large left deviation while the tornado was getting bigger and faster, which is one of the things that made it very dangerous. And if we look at this, once again, I'm missing my column over here, but if we put El Reno in here, it seems to fit kind of with Hoisington and Greensburg in that the mid-level winds, 7 to 500 millibar, were between 40 and 45 knots. And it did have that left deviation. I won't compare it directly to Hoisington, but it was a pretty sharp left deviation. It's still fairly large. So if I'm going to make some really ballpark suggestions or thoughts maybe to look at more, like I said, if, if the wind fields in general are weaker, but they're still just strong enough to support a supercell, say 30 to 35 knots of flow at 500 millibars, then you're going to maybe possibly get more interesting or unusual storm motions and tornado motions. These are not necessarily the same, though they're related at times. But you may get, may get more unusual tornado motions when those winds are weaker, but still capable of supporting a supercell. And then just looking at that 7 to 500 millibar average, I'm going to take a look at this more with a larger data set. But I think if your average winds in this layer are up in the 50s or, or greater, 50 knots or so or greater, you're going to get a relatively straight track that will go pretty much with storm motion algorithms that are out there and, and probably won't surprise you too much. It'll probably be just a little bit right of the mean wind. Now if your winds get a little weaker, I'm speculating here, but if they're more in this 40 to 45 not range, I would suggest maybe you watch for possible backwards C or backwards comma tracks in the latter half of the tornado's life. We're getting much less than that down in the 30s, particularly if you're around 30 to 35 knots, which the Bennington tornado and supercell, that was what that environment was. You may get some unusual looping and deviations there. So that might give you a little bit of idea. If you're trying to forecast what the storm motion is, you might want to watch out for this and this, and be aware that you can get some, some unusual storm motion deviations that aren't exactly maybe what you would expect just looking at, say, the 500 millibar winds. I, I would say, I mean, I would say El Reno probably falls in this category, in these loose categories, because it has this, but boy, it's got a really extreme left deviation. I was going to say with Bennington, that was three days, I think, before uh, Reno. I wonder if that tornado kind of velocitized a few of us, or anesthetized a few of us, because it sat there for an hour and we could just sit and watch it. And I know some people have got up fairly close to it. I stayed back probably about two or three miles to the west, to the east and, and watched it. Big tornado, but it wasn't moving a whole lot. You didn't want to be right behind it when it started moving backwards, but it was moving slow enough you could probably react to what was going on. You could see it most of the time. It was a little wrapped in rain at, at some times. But this, this was, I hate to use the word fun, but it was one of those fun tornadoes to kind of chase because it didn't hit much of anything. It did kill some cattle, I think, out here. It didn't hit any towns or uh, kill anybody or injure anybody. And it was fun to just sit there and watch it. It was fairly visible. It didn't seem to be too dangerous because it wasn't moving fast and we, we could just sit there and watch it. So we've been in this large cape situation three days before El Reno. And then El Reno is another large cape situation, which is why a lot of us went out to chase it, which, which is why I went to central Oklahoma. I debated whether to go. But that's an interesting enough setting. I just kind of want to see what happens. I'm going to have cape probably around... 5,000 joules per kilogram. We're going to have a little more mid-level flow. We're probably not a lot of low-level shear. You don't need a lot of low-level velocity to get tornadoes when you have a lot of cape and enough mid-level flow. And I just was interested to see what would happen. So curiosity, I guess, got the, the best of me. Looks like we're frozen here.
Well, while we're getting that figured out, I'll just make a few comments. Uh, my intent is not to offend anybody. Uh, I guess this last year I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with storm chasing. What happened to Tim really affected me deeply. And I have not been storm chasing since May 31st. I made a one-and-a-half-hearted attempt to look at some thunderstorms north of Kansas City on October 4th, I think it was. And uh, I haven't felt like chasing. I, I'll pick it back up and do some of it. <coughs> this year, I think that's what Tim would want me to do. Thanks, guys. Looks like you got that going again. But uh, there's this whole issue of, do we get up close to the tornado? And I think we've seen so many people with armored vehicles and people with cool video getting up close to the tornado. And there's the combination of that with tornadoes like Bennington. They're fairly low risk because they're moving slow and you can see it. Uh, that sometimes we get ourselves into dangerous situations. And I, I think we need to caution ourselves as storm chasers that every once in a while we're going to run into something, nature's going to throw us something, we begin to think we understand things and we've seen most of it and we can kind of anticipate what's going to happen. Every once in a while nature's going to throw you something it'll tell you that, no, you don't. You do not understand. And we're going to throw you something here that doesn't fit. And I think the arena storm was that. And if, particularly if you're a new storm chaser, I would strongly recommend, and I'm going to talk a little more about that here in a moment, that if you storm chase and you don't understand what's going on with the storm and you can't figure it out, you can't really see where the tornado is or you're not sure where it's moving, get way back as much as you can. Because El Reno was one that really freaked me out. Tornadoes that are rapidly evolving and are hard to see are extremely dangerous. I just wanted to go back to this slide. I threw up several of these tracks. If you want to be northwest of the tornado track, I've heard a few storm chasers say that. I even heard somebody say that in an interview nationally. And then I heard a housewife that my wife knows say, well, I heard this guy on TV say that, well, the best place to be is northwest of the tornado. So maybe, maybe when they issue the tornado warning, I should drive northwest. <laughs> so, two things there. Some people probably are kind of idiots. The other thing is, if you're going to make comments like that in front of a camera, be a little careful because people just they take things way too literally. Anyhow, my point with this here, we got tornadoes moving south when you expect them to move east. Here's a left deviation. Let's say you're following this tornado in the daylight and you're northwest of it. And it decides to start moving. Northwest. You can get yourself in some big trouble. So just don't forget that, please. Okay. Let's now look more closely at the Elena tornado. Again, tornadoes that are rapidly evolving and hard to see are extremely dangerous. That should be an obvious comment, and maybe I'm overmaking the point, but I just want people to remember that. I'm not going to do a real detailed analysis of the environment, but real quick here with El Reno. Here we are, we've got a triple point out here over western Oklahoma, and you see towering cumulus developing rapidly here. 30 minutes later, they're already developing the thunderstorms with the explosive development, the animals blowing off. 90 minutes from the towering cumulus, we've got this really big overshooting top right there. And we've got a tornado about, about to touch down. Explosive development. Here's the 500 millibar winds off the SPC meso, meso analysis the hour before the tornado. And uh, I can't see too well here, but it looks like in this blue, your winds over central and, and eastern Oklahoma or central and western Oklahoma are around 50, 55 knots. So pretty good 500 millibar flow. Certainly stronger than the Bennington tornado three days before. Here's your cape, big cape. Anytime you see mixed layer cape of 4,500 or 5,000, that's big because you're mixing the parcels a little bit and it's still producing a lot of cake. So you've got a lot of moisture and moisture depth there. A lot of cake in this situation. The storm relative velocity or low level wind shear that we associate with supercell tornadoes, not that impressive. If we look at some of the numbers, they're only like around 100 in here. It got better during the evening after the storm formed and started producing a lot of inflow. But before the storm, not that impressive, but when you've got that much cake, maybe all you need is around 100 holistic or so. So remember that. I find those situations interesting. And if we put those two things together into the energy holistic index, it's maximized over central Oklahoma where our storms are rapidly developing. So 
pretty good environment there, and you can see why SPC issued a, a PDS watch. This is a, a diagram real quick just to show you how tornadoes, there's a lot of different ingredients or combinations of ingredients that put tornadoes on the map. All these yellow circles here are tornadoes from 2013. And I put them on this diagram that uh, Bob Johns and I used to come up with the EHI 20 some years ago. This is helicity here, gets bigger along this axis. This is Cape Small here, gets bigger along this axis in that direction. El Reno falls over here, as does Bennington and the Moore, Oklahoma tornado. There's some differences in the mid level flow that I won't get into that don't show up on this diagram. But several of our big tornadoes last year fell over here, but I just want you to realize that you can get tornadoes also with smaller Cape, around 1,000 or 500 joules, and lots of velocity. There's the Adairsville, Georgia tornado last year. I think that was in January 2013. And here's the Mississippi tornado I showed you a little while ago. EHI doesn't work as well down on this end. Lots of velocity, not as much cape. Nor does it put out huge numbers over in this area. And unfortunately, we get some big tornadoes over in that area. So those are some weaknesses of the energy velocity index for what that's worth. Now let's just look at the, the radar here. Just wanted to go through this real quick, show you that their motion on this thing is really weird. Here's our mesocyclone, here's Oklahoma City. This is where the tornado's gonna be right here. And you'll see, this is per fairly coarse data. I want you to notice that this is gonna swing southward and then curve back. It's almost like a little bowling ball and somebody's throwing a bowling ball. So they go back and it comes through and their arm accelerates as they throw the ball. It's almost like the tornado slingshotted out of here. I have no idea why that is. It, let's just look at the motion here. And you see it dips and then it begins to come back out and come up into the storm. And you get this looping. It's almost like the mesocyclone is moving around some other circulation, but I, I don't know. I don't understand what's going on there. And I just want to point out that in all, a lot of our spotter training, we're used to looking at storms like this. This is a picture by the late Eric Wynn. And this is a storm when I was out with Tim back in 2005 down in Texas, producing a tornado here. Nice wall cloud, we're looking northwest at it. Classic structure, here's your rain and hail, forward flank downdraft if you know your structure. Rain-free base here with the wall cloud and back here, back here's your rear flank downdraft. Really easy to see what's going on here. Not hard to tell where the tornado is and maybe stay out of its way. That's the tiny type of thing we, we train with and train the structure here with the tornadoes under the updraft, here's your rear flank downdraft, rain-free base, etc. Here's another one last year. This is a really cool photograph by Jonathan Williamson up in Iowa on October 4th, the day of the Wayne, Nebraska tornado. This is a, another tornado a little further east over in Iowa. You can see the tornadoes on the ground here. The lighting in here doesn't do this justice, I'm, I'm afraid, but the tornadoes here, you can see a nice wall cloud. You can see a lot of structure here. So if you could see this picture in really good lighting, all your structure is laid out for you here. And it's not hard to tell where the tornado's at. We draw the structure on here. The rear flank downdraft is behind this gust front cloud, back in here. Forward flank downdraft's over here. We have an inflow band coming into it, wall cloud, tornado, updrafts here. If you know anything about storm structure, you can see it all there. And easy to see, this is the fun stuff of the chase, and this is where it's fun to get back and look at the whole structure. And we can get into the whole debate about whether to get up close or get back. I'm not going to get off into that right now. But what do you do with this? I think there's a lot more storms out there like this than there are the nice ones that have all the nice structures. Here we're looking west, and you can't see anything in there. It just looks like a... Well, there's a circular set of plates above that, kind of telling us it's probably a supercell, but now let's, let's advance one frame. Here's a lightning flash. You see anything in there? There it is. That's the El Reno tornado, probably not too long after it had touched down. I know there's some people close to it, and you can see it in Mike Bettis' video, that you can see a lot of the vortices early on, if you're in the right position. But very rapidly, the contrast got bad. This is the storm as Shauna, my wife, and I were approaching it. I'll come back to this. Again, I just want to point out, recognize when things are really, really dangerous. It's important to be able to, to tell that. 
We're approaching the El Reno storm here on I-40. This is the El Reno exit right here. And I, at this point, I was already saying, oh, crap, it looks like this is going to be one of those low-contrast HP storms, which wasn't exactly what I was expecting that day. Here we're southwest of El Reno. We're quite some distance from where the tornado touched down, and some people got some good video of that, I know. But if you look really closely where that arrow is, you can, we can briefly see for a moment a, a good funnel under a rain-free base, and then disappeared in there from our vantage point because there was rain and low contrast behind it. And then here's this image where we decided to turn west and go toward it. And there's one lightning flash. I couldn't see that with my naked eye now. My wife has better vision. She said, there's something in there. We need to be really careful here. And I said, I want to go another mile west and just let's see if we can see anything. And she said, no, we really ought to go south and get out of the way of this. And I think she was right. I will give her that credit. She's She's right more often than I am sometimes when I'm chasing. So here we are, we're approaching the storm. There's another lightning flash. Here we can see the tornado there. I thought I could see that one with my naked eye. We get to the next road and I decide, let's, let's go south because I'm watching it. And it looks, I'm expecting it to come east or maybe east-northeast. I wasn't sure. And it looks to me like it's going southeast. And I'm not, why is it already going southeast, right? when it touches down. Often you think of storms, well, they, they go this way and then they begin to deviate to the right. Like so many supercells do, and the same thing may happen with the tornado. Here we're, we're heading south, got one lightning flash in there, <coughs> and I can see there's something over here. I can't tell there's a tornado there. But this looks like it's moving southeast and I'm speeding up. I've got a six-cylinder car, thank goodness now. And so I said, let's let's just go fast. And my wife said, yeah, let's let's go south and get out of here, because it's really hard to tell what's going on. Here we're due west of it, lightning flash, you can see. This turns out to be the interior vortex. We'll talk more about that in a moment. There's what that looks like. You're just looking at it, looking due west, it just looks like a pile of rain. But it was coming pretty fast at this point, my wife said, we just really need to keep going. I said, no, I, I want to stop, I want to look at this. That's me. Here's uh, Josh Worman's paper. Tim Marshall's a co-author on this. He may talk more about some of this this afternoon. I've already a couple of graphics. I hope I'm interpreting them properly. Here's Highway 81, and, and what they've done is they've circled the larger scale vortex here in this white green circle, and then inside that there's a, a stronger, or at least a strong interior vortex. Now, I just took the liberty of Moving that further west, we were back about three miles west of Highway 81. And this is what it would look like close to our position at that time. And here's, here's the velocity where you can see the wider circulation. And I've taken the liberty of putting a tighter circle in here that shows where the interior vortex is. And notice on the scale here, this is pretty wide. It's at least a mile wide and maybe wider. So let's go back to our picture and try to relate, relate that visually. Yeah, this looks like a big HP storm, but there was something gnarly looking about it, and that we wanted to get out of the way of it. Couldn't tell what the motion is there. We see this. That's probably an interior subvortex, which is what they were pointing out in the paper with their graphics there. This looks like these a tornado, but <coughs> if we look at the wider or larger vortex, which may be a multi-vortex mesocyclone, which is what I think they call it in the paper, or the tornado. It's probably at least this wide, and we can see these rain bands moving around in here. So this may be more the tornado than just that. I think that may be one of the problems as the tornado approached Highway 81, and why a lot of people suddenly were taken aback. Of course, it was accelerating and getting bigger. But at times, I noticed on Mike Bettis' video, it looked like you could see this interior vortex. But they were also in the tornado as they were going south, just to the east of this interior vortex, and there's tornadic winds outside of this. And to me, that just gets across the idea. Again, I hope I don't offend anybody, but I hate the term bear's cage. I think it's one of the stupidest terms now that I've ever heard, because I'm not sure it really exists. At least it doesn't exist in a lot of tornadoes. It sure didn't exist here, because you've got all these rain curtains. I guess the idea with the bear's cage is you have a little rain curtain, which is kind of the hook. And you can get inside of that, and there's the tornado, and you're there with the bear, and you're, you're this hero as you grapple with the bear. And that concept is, is, 
to me kind of ridiculous. It doesn't even relate in this situation because this whole thing is probably a tornado with vortices rapidly developing inside of it. And if you want to get in there and think you're in a bear's cage, well, you're probably in there with 20 bears. You don't realize it until it's too late. So we're looking at this without the lightning. See how wide this is. And I'll be honest with you, I've seen a lot of HP storms look like this. And I'm going, am I looking at rain? Or is it a tornado? Hard to tell. I stopped. My wife told me not to. But I was driving and she was getting to see it. And I wanted to stop and just look at it for a moment. I didn't take any more than 10 seconds. I got out of the car. I was going to do a, a quick frame advance. The lighting in here, unfortunately, is not good enough. You can see white rain curtains, and they're going really fast. And I took 10 seconds and looked at that. I thought I had cleared the path. I'm looking west, northwest. I said, I got back in the car and said, Shauna, honey, you are right. We're getting out of here fast. Because I don't understand what we're looking at. I can't see how big it is. I don't know if it's coming toward us, southeast. I don't know if it's moving east. And it may be expanding. So that kind of freaked me out. Again, here's the size of the tornado, and there's an interior vortex. But the point here is there's a larger vortex here that looks like rain curtains. You may think, well, that's just rain curtains outside the tornado. No, I think that was the tornado. And that may be one of the problems. Again, it was hard to assess what was going on here. 81, you see this thing coming. It's accelerating. You can't tell what's tornado and what's rain. With some of the back landing, you can see the interior vortex sometimes in the center, which didn't always stay in the center later. And so you may have interpreted things wrong. And the point I'm making here is that this was, was evolving so quickly and I didn't understand what was going on. We made the decision to get the heck out of Dodge. I'm looking southwest here now. And we saw these rain curtains here. It looked like they were expanding rapidly. I wondered, is this part of the tornado? Are we going to get a really strong RFD here? That was scary. So we, we got in the car and we blasted south. I went three miles south. And then we, we stayed back and watched the tornado from that viewpoint. I just want to show you how rapidly evolving... Uh, RFD is here. This is about the time Sean and I had stopped and looked at it and then we took off to the south. We're looking westward here. This is Nick Nolte's really cool time lapse which you can find on YouTube. I just took some frames out of this and I think this is over about a minute and a half time. Notice this is the RFD back here with the rain. It's kind of a wet RFD. Look how fast that comes around. It looks like a big curtain. Looking at that, a lot of people wouldn't realize that's really a tornado, and maybe the RFD is right up against it, and this is the tornado. We did go south and uh, came back over to 81 and watched the tornado about three miles distant from the south. If you look closely here, you can see multiple vortices that look like they're big. See those? Rotating around in there. I will say that when we left our position where I had stopped and looked at the tornado and went south, my wife, and it's clearly on the video, I haven't showed the video to anybody really much, but uh, she says on the video, some chasers are going to die today. And I've heard her say things like that before, like uh, some people are going to die today. And she's often right. She seems to be pretty good at figuring out those days that are going to be the big days. I just didn't think it would be Tim. I didn't think it would be Paul. I didn't think it would be Carl. Here's our big vortex. Just want to show you here, this thing, this is about 20 seconds apart from the Worman paper. And here it looks like you have one interior vortex and then suddenly everything evolves and it's like you have two or more. It shows you how rapidly evolving things were. This thing was probably going around 55 miles per hour at this point. A lot of vortices inside there, just something so complex I can't understand it. I'm going to talk just a little bit about what happened to Tim here. Um, I know there's a lot of people, I know Dave Hogley uh, uh, was putting together lots of, or giving people to kind of pool their videos. I, I was so upset after this that uh, about the only person I could talk to was Mark Austin uh, at Norman about some of the specifics of what happened. He was really nice to spend some time with me on the phone and explain what he thought maybe happened and what they'd seen out in the field, look at, at things after the fact and, and some of the, the data they had. And so I want to give Mark some real credit. I appreciate him spending some time talking to me about this. But let's, let's focus in on this area right here. This is from Jeff Petrowski's video, which is on YouTube. 
I had a nice chat with Jeff this morning about some of this. Here it's east of 81, we're looking south. This is the tornado. I'm not sure a lot of people would recognize this as a tornado if they hadn't been watching it for a while. It just looks like a bunch of rain to me. Notice they're going east. Notice there's a dark column that suddenly appears. You have to look for it. But as they approach Alphadale Road, there's a dark column here. There's another one here, but this seems to be the darker one. <coughs> now you can see it better. It's right there. Looking due south, and it looks like it's pretty close to Alphadale Road. I wonder if that's the interior vortex of the tornado, the one that it did in the center. It's now, this is from the Worman paper here. It's doing a accelerating and doing a little loop-de-loop -loop here. This is Alphadale Road, and I think Jeff's position is up here, and they're looking south. We may be seeing that vortex here. Tim and Carl and Paul were coming along on Reuter Road here. This interior vortex accelerated northeastward and then came right back up even went north-northwest for a moment and hit the road here where they were. And this is a video, I think, by Jim Bishop for the northeast. You can see a vortex here. You have to squint and it doesn't show up in here. There's even a set of headlights that shows up in here. I wonder if that might be Tim's car. And that's this loop-de-loop -loop thing going on here. Don't want to get into a lot of detail. This is this is back to the Petrowskis here. They're smartly blasting east because they can see how quickly this is evolving. This may be this may be that interior vortex when it was near Reuter Road and became stationary for just a bit. In fact, it looks like a little tor looks like a tornado within the larger tornado with even a rear inflow jet here from the video, looking southwest. And then everything fills back in from Jim Bishop's standpoint up here, I-40. And the tornado got big, lots of condensation, you can't see what's going on. Really big and dangerous. Here's what it looked like from the east. This is Dan Robinson's video. He was just ahead of Tim. I was able to get out of harm's way, fortunately. There's the tornado there, and you can see it to the northwest. A lot of different views. Looks like I just hit. There we go. I'm good. This is from my vantage point with Shauna. Um, couldn't tell what was the tornado, but it's probably a two-mile-wide tornado at this point. So again, make the point that this type of storm is relatively easy to chase. If it's moving slow, and you can see what's going on. This is not, particularly if you're an inexperienced chaser, maybe also you're an experienced chaser. Learn to realize that when you see something like this and it's moving pretty quickly, and you can't see the structure, and you're not sure what's going on, Give the thing plenty of birth, a wide birth. Now, no, I'm not saying that Tim should have done that because I think he just encountered something he hadn't encountered before, and they were trying to deploy probes. And he just ran into the, the storm at the wrong place. There's the tornado inside there. I won't say much about this, but uh, just remind everybody about the fiasco that went on, went on in Oklahoma City <coughs> after the arena tornado where I was trying to figure out what this is about. My wife uh, wrote a nice essay and put it up on the blog because she was pretty upset. We got stuck in a, in a freeway. We kept trying to get south and away from the storm. And more and more people were out on the roads, thousands of them. And some of the freeways became like parking lots because people had this idea. Now well, there's maybe one particular meteorologist who was suggesting that people drive south because of the, how strong the tornado was coming in the oh, side of Oklahoma City. And it wasn't all that. It was also the more Oklahoma tornado. There had been some people who, in interviews, said, well, we just got in our cars and we left town and went south. It was probably a lot easier to leave more Oklahoma and go south than the center part of Oklahoma City. And uh, some people were safe that way. So everybody thinks, well, we just need to get in our car and leave. <laughs> and in a metro area, that doesn't work. So. Uh, various mesocyclones and even some weak tornadoes occurred in the Oklahoma City metro area. We're on this, uh, I can't remember the road number, this is in Mustang, we're trying to get south. Mesocyclone developing off to our west. Got a tornado warning out for us and we're just sitting still. You can see a side road here where all the cars are jammed up. We're sitting on the freeway, it's jammed up. And mesocyclone goes right over us and circling with curtains of rain and there we are. Thank God there was not a huge, strong tornado 
here. Thankfully, there had been enough outflow from the storm that went south that the mesocyclones began to form and go over the top of the cold air, and I think that mitigated a lot of the, the tornado threat. But this was very disturbing. And I don't know what else to say about that. Very tragic, disturbing day, something I'm not going to forget. Okay, let's see how much time we have left here. Yeah, five, ten minutes. Okay, I'm going to say some things about Tim, because I want to. Uh, went out on an expedition with him and Carl back in 2005. And, you know, if I'm going to pick out five or ten things I've done in my life that are things I will always remember, that was one of them. It was really fun working with them. And we saw so many tornadoes on that trip, I don't remember how many there were. And I, went, I would see Carl years after that, and we just kind of smile and we talk about it for a moment, because we, we both really enjoyed that trip. Uh, Tim, Tim is an interesting person. He's, he's got this really gift, he had this really positive gift, away from any of the storm chasing, where he could talk with you for a few minutes, and if he saw you had something you were really interested in or were passionate about, he would encourage you somehow. He would, I always came away from conversations with him feeling uplifted. And through a lot of my life, I've struggled with what I could do. I had a lot of trouble with math and physics and didn't think I could do meteorology. And I eventually got a meteorology degree and found I could do some research. But I didn't have a lot of confidence a lot of times. And I had a lot of people tell me I couldn't do some of the things I was trying to do. Tim was a strong enough individual that when somebody told him he couldn't do something, or that he was barking up the wrong tree, he'd just go ahead and do it. He said, yeah, I know myself well enough. I can do this. Tim didn't have a college degree. I didn't find that out until a long time later. I'd sit and have conversations about his equipment, his probes, the cameras he was putting together for shooting lightning. I, I just, my jaw would drop because he was so, so creative, so inventive, and so sharp. And back to the positive thing, he just had that gift. I think when he talked to teenagers, kids, adults, if he could see he was really interested in something and had a passion about it, he had this subtle but very positive way of being able to encourage you. And that, that, that really affected me. You know, I wasn't real close to Tim, but he was a close colleague. We only talked to him maybe a couple times a year, but he had a really strong impact on my life. He made me feel more confident about some of the work I was doing. Because I struggled in school, and he was kind of an outsider too, and I drew strength from that. I was really impressed with that. That meant a lot to me. Tim was, was humble. I you know that uh, Kathy used that term. Didn't seem to have a big ego. Didn't seem to be out there promoting himself all the time like I see some people, which gets a little old. Tim seemed to get the respect because he did good work. And people recognized that. He had good ideas, and then he could go get funding. People would, uh, maybe they'd want to put him on TV, do interviews, and he'd do that stuff, but he could get funding from some of that as well. So, he got respect because I think he, he let his work speak for himself and he let his person speak for him. <coughs> Tim had boundless energy. He was only two years younger than me. I'd like to say he is only two years younger than me. But when we were out in 2005, I mean, I, if anybody's chased with me, they know I have very big ups and downs energy-wise when I chase. And that's why sometimes I limit the people I chase with because that throws them a bit. But uh, he'd, he'd come up to me. We were on that Texas trip trying to deploy probes. We had one attempt, and then we were trying to group as the tornado looked like it was going to reform in the east. He'd come up to me and said, John, are you with me? Come on. Let's, let's go do this. And I come out of my little trance and say, yeah, we'll go do it. But I was always amazed at how much energy he had. Tim's going to be really missed. Paul, I didn't know Paul very well. I've only talked to him a couple of times. My wife kind of got to know him a bit on Facebook. I know Tim would talk about Paul back, back when I was out with him in 2005. How he was kind of trying to find his way and what he wanted to do. A lot like uh, stepson I have now. My wife's son, Zach. And it, it sounds like he was finding his way just fine. He, he got into photography, did some great photography. 
I think he had more of a creative side in a way, maybe than Tim had. And he was very interested in a lot of what his dad did. He'd go with him, but he'd do a lot of the photography thing. And he was really making his way. And I know Tim took pride in that. And it's too bad he's gone. And Carl. This is on our 2005 trip. Carl was always enthusiastic and just uplifting. Didn't seem to have a lot of ego. Didn't always seem to be trying to let people know how good he was, either with forecasting or what he was doing. He was just fun. I remember the conversations we'd have making our forecasts in the morning. I was along with him to, with Tim to make forecasts and help with some of the deployments. We had great conversations about forecasts, and he'd save all these graphics, and I have a CD up on my shelf where uh, he sent that to me after our trip and said, here, John, here's some maps you may not have. I saved these, and you may want to look at these and remember our trip. And I, I value that CD with the note he put on top of it. Carl was a lot of fun. And uh, as my wife will say, uh, at the conference here, he kind of became my wife's uh, party partner on Saturday nights. There was a point where we started getting into this thing where we wear hats and have some fun. And he was kind of the life of the party sometimes. And I wish I'd gotten to know Carl better. I really do. I thought I'd have more time to do that. So three, three really good men. Sorry. When people are gone, they live on in our memories, and that's that's what I'm going to do with Tim and Paul and Carl. Thanks for listening. I think my time's up. If anybody has questions or anything they want to discuss, I'll be And everybody, Happy Samaritan's right here, by the way. What's that? Happy Samaritan's <laughs> right Minutes. I just wanted to read a little announcement for you. Uh, the Colorado Aries folks actually.